Hello, everyone. My title has changed a little bit. What abilities and skills do our children need to succeed in the 21st century? Think about it for a second. Think about what your own answers might be. My list includes things like creative problem solving, being able to think outside the box. Maybe there's a problem that none of us have been able to find a solution to. And maybe if we think about it in a new way or think about solving it in a new way, we'll be able to finally solve it. Flexibility, being able to take advantage of serendipity. Maybe you are planning to do one thing, but a new opportunity has arisen. Or the flexibility to get around obstacles. Or the flexibility to admit that you were wrong when you get new information. An example of poor cognitive flexibility is given by Alexander Graham Bell. When one door closes, another door opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones which open for us. Another thing children are gonna need is self-control. Having the self-control to resist temptations and not act impulsively, to think before you speak, to give a considered response instead of an impulsive one. Maybe to not hit send immediately on the email message. Or when you see an old friend who you haven't seen in years, a dear friend, Maybe your first reaction in seeing this wonderful friend is, my God, how much weight you gained. But you don't say that. You inhibit saying that and instead say something to make your friend feel better. Or to resist the temptation for tit for tat if somebody hurts your feelings and your first impulse is to hurt them back. And discipline, perseverance, having the discipline to see things through to completion even though maybe you have, you're frustrated or you're bored or there are a lot more fun things you'd like to do. Evidence shows that discipline accounts for over twice as much variation in final grades in college as does IQ. All of the above that I talked about are executive functions or depend on them. The core executive functions are cognitive flexibility, that's the creative problem solving I talked about and the flexibility I talked about. Inhibitory control is a second core executive function, and that includes the self-control and the discipline I talked about. And working memory I haven't addressed yet. And from these, higher level executive functions are built, like problem solving, reasoning, and planning. Inhibitory control, resisting a strong impulse to do one thing and instead doing what's most appropriate or needed. It not only includes discipline and self-control, it also includes selective attention, being able to keep your attention focused on what you want and resist distraction. Inhibitory control predicts academic performance in the earliest elementary grades through university better than does IQ. Children with better inhibitory control, that is children who are more persistent, less impulsive, and had better attention regulation. When they were little kids, as adults 30 years later, have better health, higher incomes and better jobs, fewer run-ins with the law, and a better quality of life than those who as little kids had worse inhibitory control. And that's true controlling for everything under the sun. It's based on a study of 1,000 children born in the same city in the same year, followed for 32 years with a 96% retention rate. Unfortunately, I didn't do the study. The authors conclude interventions that achieve even small improvements in inhibitory control for individuals could shift the entire distribution of outcomes in a beneficial direction and yield large improvements in health wealth and crime rate for a nation. Working memory is holding information in mind and working with it. It's not simply holding information in mind, like repeat the digits I say to you. That's short-term memory. Working memory is holding them in mind and doing something with them, like reordering those digits in numerical order. 
Working memory is critical for anything that unfolds over time because that always requires holding in mind what came earlier and relating that to what's happening now. So that's critical for anything that involves language because that always involves holding in mind what you heard earlier and relating that to what you're hearing now or holding in mind what you read earlier and relating that to what you're reading now. Reasoning would not be possible without working memory, for reasoning requires holding bits of information in mind and seeing how they relate. Working memory enables us to consider the past and possible future in making plans and decisions. Inhibitory control is by far the greatest challenge for little kids, disproportionately challenging for little kids. We adults may not appreciate how incredibly difficult inhibition is for little kids because it's so much less difficult for us. It's one thing to talk about executive function. It's another thing to actually see what I'm talking about. So I'd like you to experience one of the measures we use. This is appropriate for children from four years of age through adults. So from four years of age on up. The rules are, when you see a heart, you press on the same side. You have a response button for each hand. And when you see a flower, you respond on the opposite side. Okay? So imagine you have a response button for each hand. Nobody is going to know how you perform. It's completely anonymous. Okay? So first we're going to do hearts. Always press on the same side as the heart. Ready? Excellent. Okay. Good. Okay, now you're only going to see flowers. Always press on the side opposite the flower. Ready? Here we go. Excellent. Okay. Now you're going to get the same thing, but they're going to be intermixed. Sometimes you'll see a heart and sometimes you'll see a flower, but the same rules. Heart, same side, flower opposite. Heart, same side, flower opposite. Okay, hopefully a few of you made mistakes for the last group because that's normal for adults. Children also make mistakes and as you, they didn't forget the rules. They still knew it was heart, same side, flower, opposite, but they couldn't get their hands to activate that fast enough. Now, as you probably noticed, even if I gave you a lot of trials, adults are as good on flowers as they are on hearts. We make as few mistakes and we're as fast if I gave you a whole lot of flower trials or, and a whole lot of heart trials. Where we make mistakes is when they're mixed together. Okay, that's disproportionately difficult. We're much slower, we make more mistakes. The same is true of children at all ages. The mixed condition is disproportionately harder than just flowers or just hearts. But there's one effect that you see in children that's completely absent in us. And we see it at all ages, from four years through 13. We haven't looked older than 13. And that is that children are significantly worse just on a block of flowers. They make more mistakes and they're slower, but that's completely not true of us. This is an effect true at every age in children, utterly absent in adults. What's the difference between hearts and flowers? Each has only one rule. The only difference is that for hearts you do what comes naturally, and for flowers you have to do the opposite of that. So flowers requires inhibition, hearts doesn't, the cost of inhibition is obvious in children, but you don't see it in us adults. Even very little kids, though, have excellent memories. If you've ever played the game concentration with a five-year-old, the five-year-old will probably beat you. They have wonderful memories. So we did another condition. Here the stimuli are in the center, so no hand is preferentially activated. And you need to learn the rule that for one stupid shape you press on the left and for the other stupid shape you press on the right. And after you've learned that and practiced that, we introduce four more stupid shapes. So now you have six abstract shapes. 
with six arbitrary rules, press right or left. And the incredible thing is that for children four to nine years of age, the difference in their performance on flowers versus hearts is greater than the difference in their performance for six abstract shapes versus two. Of course, the opposite is true for us. It's, we do much worse with six things to remember than just two, and we show no difference for flowers versus hearts. The cost associated with memory is much greater for us adults. The cost associated with inhibition is much greater for little kids. We adults may not appreciate how inordinately difficult inhibition is for young children because it's so much less taxing for us. Okay, executive functions depend on prefrontal cortex, of course, and the other neural regions with which they're interconnected. Unusual properties of the prefrontal dopamine system contribute to prefrontal cortex's vulnerability to environmental and genetic variations that have little effect elsewhere in the brain. Much of the presynaptically released dopamine doesn't reach the postsynaptic neuron and needs to be cleared from the space between and around neurons. The very best way for clearing released dopamine is with dopamine transporter protein. Dopamine transporter is abundant in much of the brain, including the striatum, but it's sparse in prefrontal cortex. So here's a little cartoon of that. This is supposed to represent two neurons in the striatum. Here's the synapse. Here's the uh, dopamine transporter, the white stuff. And what you're supposed to notice is that there's a lot of the white stuff, and it's located just where you'd like it, right near the synapse. So the striatum has lots of dopamine transporter located just where you want. But poor prefrontal cortex has very little dopamine transporter, and it's not located uh, near the synapse, which would be best. So um, genes that affect the dopamine transporter are not going to be so important for prefrontal cortex, and other ways to clear dopamine are going to be very important for prefrontal cortex. So let's think about ADHD for a minute. It's pretty well established that the types of ADHD that include hyperactivity are probably a primary disorder in the striatum, and the problem is in a striatal prefrontal loop. But I hypothesize that ADD, the type of ADHD that's inattentive, is a primary problem in prefrontal, and it's probably a prefrontal parietal loop. So there's overlap, but there's also difference. Polymorphisms of the dopamine transporter gene, the DAT1 gene, should be important in the striatum where there's lots of dopamine transporter and so should be important for the types of ADHD that include hyperactivity. Levels of hyperactive impulsive symptoms are correlated with the number of DAT1 high-risk alleles, but levels of inattentive symptoms are not. DAT binding, specifically in the striatum, has been found to be related to motor hyperactivity, but not to inattentive symptoms. Now, the dopamine receptor subtype D4, DRD4, is present in prefrontal cortex in humans, but not in the striatum. So polymorphisms of the DRD4 gene should be important for the prefrontal cortex and should be important for the types of ADHD that, include, that, include, that are specifically inattentive and should be important for the inattentive symptoms of the combined type. That one gene expression preferentially affects the chordate, as you would expect, where there's dopamine transporter, while DRD4 gene expression preferentially affects prefrontal gray, mat gray matter volume. Um, the link between DRD4 and attention has been found in studies like Auerbach. She also found it related to working memory. A recent study, this is uh, the year is wrong, it's 2013, this year. In the face of less positive parenting, children with at least one seven-repeat allele of the DRD4 gene showed worse inhibitory control. A, the type of ADHD that's inattentive type is a different disorder from the types of ADHD that include hyperactivity. They show different cognitive and behavioral profiles, different patterns of comorbidity, 
different responses to meds and different underlying neurobiologies. ADHD children tend to be frenetic and hyperactive. A significant proportion of the inattentive type children, however, are exactly the opposite, hypoactive, sluggish, and very slow to respond. ADHD children, the type of children who have the hyperactive type, tend to be insufficiently self-conscious, whereas the children of the inattentive type tend to be overly self-conscious. Both groups tend to have social problems, but for different reasons. A child with, the, with hyperactivity alienates other kids by butting in, taking their things, failing to wait his or her turn, or acting without having first considered others' feelings. Whereas the inattentive type child is likely to have social problems because of being too passive or shy. The inattentive type child is not so much easily distracted as easily bored. The problem seems to be an under-motivation, under-arousal, not enough adrenaline getting in. And so it's not so much that distraction derails them as that they go looking for distraction because their interest in what they started doing has now dwindled. Challenge or risk, something to literally get their adrenaline pumping, can be key to keeping their attention and to eliciting optimum performance. So adults of the inattentive type sometimes say that they can focus better when they're driving if they go over the speed limit. Now, you know the action of methylphenidate at high doses. It inhibits reuptake. And what that means is it's inhibiting reuptake of the dopamine transporter. So that's going to be important in the striatum, but it's going to be irrelevant in prefrontal cortex. Most children with, who have uh, hyperactivity respond positively to methylphenidate in moderate to high doses. The opposite is true for kids of the inattentive type. They often don't respond well to methylphenidate, and when they do, it's to low doses. Recent research shows that low doses of methylphenidate, doses that are effective for the executive function, prefrontal problems, only low doses preferentially increase dopamine release in prefrontal and preferentially enhance signal processing in prefrontal cortex. That is, the action of methylphenidate in low doses is different from the action of methylphenidate in moderate to high doses. OK, this is um, um, uh, that I'm going to introduce another topic. It's still relevant to the fact that prefrontal cortex has very little dopamine transporter. Another consequence is that, of that is that prefrontal cortex has to be more dependent on secondary mechanisms such as the COMT, catecholomethyltransferase enzyme, for clearing release dopamine. Very creatively, the gene that codes for the COMT enzyme is called the COMT gene. There's a very common variation of the COMT gene. I'm not even going to call it a polymorphism, because it's 50-50 chance that you'll have alleles for one or the other. And it's a simple substitution of methionine for valine at codon 158 on the gene. The effect of that on the enzyme is illustrated in this diagram. So if you're homozygous for the valine version of COMT, you're going to have a faster acting enzyme. So it's going to clear dopamine in prefrontal faster, and the result is going to be less dopamine hanging around for shorter times in prefrontal. If you're homozygous for the methionine version of COMT, you're going to have a slower acting enzyme. It clears dopamine more slowly from prefrontal. So the result is more dopamine staying in prefrontal longer if you have the methionine version of COMT. That version, the methionine version, is generally associated with better prefrontal cortex function and better executive functions. The optimum level of dopamine in prefrontal is an intermediate level. So if most studies find that the methionine people have optimal executive functions, then they're probably close to the optimum point on the dopamine curve. If the valine version clears dopamine more slowly and gives you not such a good executive function, you're probably on this side of the dopamine curve. They probably have a little too little dopamine in prefrontal cortex. Now, the effect of the COMP gene is specific to executive functions. 
There's no relationship be between whether you have methionine or valine at codon 158 and IQ or memory or other non-prefrontal functions. Uh, and what we showed is that this effect is also true in children. So here you see the effect on a task dependent on executive functions, dependent on dopamine and prefrontal. The children who are homozygous for methionine do best. The children homozygous for valine do worst. This test depends on prefrontal, but it doesn't depend on dopamine in prefrontal. And so we included it because we did not expect an effect of the comp gene, and you don't see one. Recall memory depends more on the medial temporal lobe. Mental rotation depends more on parietal. So the effect is specific to prefrontal cortex to the dopamine system in prefrontal. Now, what's the downside of the methionine version of COMPT? I told you that you have a 50-50 chance of having an allele for methionine or allele for valine. If methionine gives you better executive function, you would expect that it would be selected for. So what's the downside of this that it hasn't been selected for? That it's equally probable that you'll have alleles from, for valine or methionine. Well, the effect even of mild stress on prefrontal cortex is to dramatically increase the level of dopamine in prefrontal. So here's the dopamine level in prefrontal under mild stress. You don't see this effect on the dopamine systems in other regions of the brain. Even the nucleus accumbens or the striatum, which of course have much more dopamine than prefrontal. Mild stress selectively, dramatically increases dopamine in prefrontal and often takes prefrontal offline. It's like, um, uh, giving your car engine way too much gasoline. Your car engine can't function properly. Prefrontal can't function properly with too much dopamine. So remember, the, at baseline, without stress, the methionine people seem to be doing best. So what is the effect of mild stress going to be? It's likely to push the methionine people past the optimum point. So they're going to start to fall apart whereas the valine people should be able to handle it much better and, in fact, do better. And there's a recent study out of Germany which shows just that. Here you see, under stress, that the people homozygous for valine are doing better. This was too easy, so there was no difference. This was too hard. But at the sensitive two-back condition, you, you see that the valine people are doing better under stress. Also, people homozygous for methionine show other sensitivities to stress. They show higher anxiety and have, higher, have heightened pain stress responses. It's long been known that some of the brightest people also have the most fragile personalities and are highly reactive to stress. Here's a possible mechanism for why the two might go together. Pediatrician Tom Boyce talks about dandelion and orchid children. The dandelions are children who do okay wherever they're planted. They're often seen as models of resilience. Perhaps children homozygous for veiling are the dandelions. They'll do okay even in a stressful environment, but by lack the exquisite fine tuning of prefrontal cortex needed to achieve the brilliance of which a met child might be capable. Research shows that some of the children who look the worst when they're in an unsupportive, stressful environment are exactly those who blossom the most when in a good environment. It's not simply that they catch up, it's that they outshine everyone when they're in a good environment. Perhaps some children homozygous for met are among the orchids. They might look like a disaster when in a stressful environment, yet might blossom brilliantly in the right environment. The, the MET version of COMPT, which confers risk on individuals when they're in adverse stressful circumstances, holds out promise of extraordinary potential if only the right fit of circumstances can be found for the individual. A child who's not doing well in one environment or with a particular instructional style might shine in another environment or with a different instructional style. Now, since at least 2003, we've, we've known that there's a gender difference in animals 
in the effect of mild stress on te cognitive tests that require prefrontal cortex. Males do better, females do worse. It's not that the female animals are dummies. They do at least as well when they're calm as the males do when they're stressed. But there's an opposite effect of mild stress. Mild stress improves the performance of males and impairs the performance of females. That's often been talked about only in terms of the HPA axis in the hippocampus. But think about it for a minute in terms of dopamine and prefrontal. Remember, stress increases dopamine and prefrontal. Remember that the optimal level of dopamine and prefrontal is an intermediate level. So maybe females start out with the optimal level of dopamine and prefrontal, and maybe males start out with slightly too little dopamine and prefrontal. If that's true, then female animals should do great at baseline because they're at the optimum point. And males should need a little bit of stress to bring them up to optimal performance. So it's consistent with the pattern that you see in animals. Why? Why might females have higher baseline levels of dopamine in prefrontal than males? Well, estrogen downregulates comp gene transcription. Comp enzymatic activity is 30% lower in women than in men. And COMT enzyme activity varies with the estrous cycle in animals. It shows an inverse relationship between COMT activity and estrogen levels. This is a um, um, study out of Amy Arnston's lab where she didn't stress the animals in the environment. She gave them a drug to make them think that they were being stressed. So males didn't perform any worse with this drug, but female animals did. So these are the males, these are the females. Now this slide is only females. These are females when their estrogen levels are low, and these are females when their estrogen levels are high. So you only see the gender difference in the effect of the drug that stimulates stress when the estrogen levels were high in the females. So we hypothesize that which version of the COM gene would be most beneficial for executive function would vary for females by their estrogen levels. So when estrogen levels are low, they should show, show the same pattern as males. They should look great when they're met. But when estrogen levels are high, estrogen makes um, dopamine levels high, met makes dopamine levels high, it'll probably push them past, so they might look better when they're homozygous for veiling. And that's exactly what we found. So here, during the mid-luteal phase of the estrogen cycle, when estrogen levels are high, females look best. They take the least time to respond when they're homozygous for veiling. When estrogen levels are low in the follicular phase, females show the same pattern as males. They look better when they're homozygous for met. And that's the work of Jeanette Evans, who was a wonderful graduate student in the lab and is now a medical student in Ottawa. If women have higher baseline levels of dopamine and prefrontal, that has implications for gender and menstrual phase differences in the optimal dosage levels of medications that affect prefrontal dopamine. Okay, so we hypothesize, we haven't finished collecting all the data, that the effect of stress should, have, should be different in females when their estrogen levels are high, but when their estrogen levels are low, it should be the same in males and females. And we're collecting that data now, or Galnush in my lab is collecting the data. To test our hypothesis concerning the mechanism by which stress affects cognition differently in men and women, we're attempting to model the effects of mild stress on executive functions pharmacologically. At low doses, the mode of action of methylphenidate is different, remember. It preferentially incre increases dopamine and prefrontal. So we predict that low-dose methylphenidate should have the same effect as being homozygous for MET. It should increase dopamine levels. So it should help males, but not help females when their estrogen levels are high. That's what we predict and we're testing in the lab. The doses of methylphenidate that are optimal for controlling behavioral problems are probably too high for aiding cognitive problems. 
Indeed, they can have the effect on an ADHD patient of being less able to concentrate and attend, to be more in a daze. Now, how do you determine whether a particular dose of methylphenidate is optimal for a child? Usually, you'll do a dose-response curve if, if you're responsible, instead of just picking a dose out of the hat. And then you ask the parent, is it working? Maybe you ask the teacher, is it working? And the parent is going to base her answer on the child's behavior. The dose of methylphenidate that's best for behavior is probably too high for cognition. But none of us are testing the child on any cognitive test to see if that dose of methylphenidate is best for the child's executive functions. I hypothesize that many children with ADHD are being prescribed a level of methylphenidate that's too high for optimal performance in school, and that the high level of methylphenidate is actually impairing their ability to get as much out of class as they could without medication. They're not bothering the teacher on the meds. They're sitting in their seat and they're very quiet. But if they're in a daze, they're not getting as much out of class. Okay, I'm gonna change gears for the last time and now talk about environmental things. Prefrontal cortex is the early warning system in the brain. It's the most vulnerable. Not only is it the most vulnerable to closed head injury because it's where it's located, but it's the most, it, it's like the canary in the coal mine. It's the first to show a problem if there's anything wrong in someone's life and it shows it more dramatically than any other area of the brain. So nowhere is the importance of social, emotional, and physical health for cognitive health more evident than with prefrontal cortex and executive functions. Prefrontal cortex and executive functions are the first to suffer and suffer disproportionately if we're sad or stressed, lonely, or not physically fit. Conversely, we show better executive functions when we're happy, feel socially supported, and we're physically fit. So taking those steps to go to the different posters will keep you physically fit and keep your executive functions good during the conference. Our brains work better when we're not in a stressed emotional state, and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. When you're sad, you're worse at selective attention. When you're happy, you're better at selective attention. People show more creativity when they're happy. The most heavily researched predictor of creativity in social psychology is mood. The most robust finding is that a happy mood leads to greater creativity. It enables people to work more flexibly and to see potential relatedness among unusual and atypical members of categories. Our brains work better when we're not feeling lonely or socially isolated, and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. This is an example of just two studies. One group of researchers told one group of subjects to expect that they would have close relationships throughout their lives. They told another group the opposite, and they told the third group unrelated bad news. So on simple memorization questions that don't require executive functions, all three groups perform comparably. But on logical reasoning that requires executive functions, those told to expect that they'd be lonely performed worse. Other researchers haven't um, tried to manipulate how you feel. They simply ask you how you feel when you come in the lab. So they ask you questions like, do you feel socially supported? Do you feel lonely? And what they find is that those who report that they feel lonely, prefrontal cortex works less efficiently. We're not just intellects, emotions, and social. We also have bodies. And our brains work better when our bodies are physically fit. And that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. And this is an old study. I'll show you. Um, this is from 2008. I'll show you some recent studies in a second. But they say they, they have evidence that it's true at the molecular, cellular systems, and behavioral level. And that's been supported by much more recent studies. Science Magazine asked me to do a review of all the activities and programs that had been shown to improve children's executive functions, 
um, primary age children from ages 4 to 12. And it turns out that a lot of different activities have evidence that they can improve executive functions, including computerized training, aerobics, martial arts, yoga, mindfulness, and certain school curricula. I predict that almost any activity can be the way in, can be the means for disciplining the mind and enhancing resilience. Many activities not yet studied might well improve executive functions. It all depends on the spirit in which an activity is presented, the way one does the activity and the amount of time spent doing it, pushing oneself to do better. The most important element is probably that the child really want to do it. So she or he will spend a lot of time at it. It's the discipline, the practice, that produces the benefits. So we might as well have children do something they can put their heart and souls into. It could be music. It could be playing in an orchestra. It could be singing together with others. It could be dance. It could be sports. It could be caring for an animal. It could be doing something in nature, getting away from the busyness of the city. It could be a service activity where children work together for a cause greater than themselves. It could be circus. I have a student who was a circus performer who's come to work in my lab to get the empirical evidence to see if circus can improve executive functions and outcomes for kids. For tens of thousands of years, across all cultures, storytelling, dance, art, and play have been part of the human condition. People in all cultures made music, sang, danced, and played games. There are good reasons why those activities have lasted so long and been found so ubiquitously. They address our physical, cognitive, emotional, and social needs. They challenge our executive functions. You have to concentrate and pay attention. You have to hold complex sequences in mind. They give, make kids feel happy and proud. They address our social needs. You have a sense of belonging to a group. We are each an important member of the group. And they help our bodies develop. You have to use your body. I predict, therefore, that they'll be found to enhance executive functions. The different parts of the human being are fundamentally interrelated. Each part, cognitive, spiritual, social, emotional, and physical, probably develops best when no part is neglected. What nourishes the human spirit may also be best for executive functions. Perhaps we can learn something from the traditional practices of people across many cultures and thousands of years. Thank you very much.